The Tom Woods Show, episode 1717. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, social media is a pit of misinformation when it comes to the subject of guns. So what you need is my free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Guns. Smashes all the myths and a lot of fun to read. Pick it up at wrongaboutguns.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. John Zmirak is back with us today. John is editor over at The Stream, which you can check out at stream.org. I'm going to be linking to one of his articles from that site on the show notes page today. He's also the author of, among other books, the Politically Incorrect Guide to Catholicism. And he's got a long article on the subject of gun rights, but with a particular emphasis on the religious origins of, of such rights and what's wrong with, let's say, the mainline churches that are you know, eager to talk about gun violence and, and, and blame the gun lobby for gun violence. And, and in other words, sound just like Hillary Clinton and not really acknowledge people's rights to defend themselves. So we're going to hash that out today. John, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Good to be on. All right. You've written a couple of pieces, one of them quite long on guns and also talking about the relationship between guns and religion and religious liberty and and questions related to this. And this is rather important for a variety of reasons, not least of which is the fact that so many people who would be considered religious leaders either in the Catholic world or elsewhere around the the Christian world, are in their rhetoric so indistinguishable from secular sources that I can't for the life of me understand what purpose they think they're serving or why their own congregations think they need them. I I already have the Nation magazine. You know, I already have MSNBC. I already have CNN. What do I need you people for? I could stay home on Sunday and just watch those things on TV. So – it's important to get this right, especially when religious leaders get it so wrong. And, and in getting it so wrong, they use secular language and arguments that really are indistinguishable from what I would read in any secular source. Now, I, I've just lined that up with, I'm sure this irritates you as much as it does me. It infuriates me. and actually led me to do a lot of research with Jason Jones, my friend, co-author, We did a 25-page academic study of this, and the title is God, Guns, and the Government. And you can find it at stream.org. If you go to stream.org backslash Second Amendment, you'll come to it. And uh, what I did was I I read Dave Coppell's book on uh, morality and self-morality, violence, and self-defense, I think it is, and uh, Stephen Halbrook's book, That Every Man Be Armed. I, I dug into the background. Because my intuition told me that self-defense against violent criminals, against mobs like anti political mobs like Antifa, and against tyrannical governments, it seems to me that on a gut level that that's compatible, and that that flows out of Christianity. Whereas leaving people the puppets or the victims of whoever of whoever's the bully on their block waiting, hoping the cops will come a few, you know, 20 minutes later and put a chalk circle around their bodies or be subjugated to whatever the government decides to impose on them. That doesn't seem to me like the implications of the Christian vision of the person. And of course, maybe that's just because I grew up in America. And so when I did the research, I found that, well, yeah, there is actually a word for people who cling bitterly to their guns and their religion. That word is American. America was founded by people clinging to their religion and clinging to guns in order to protect their religion. Do you know where the the historical roots and even a lot of the text of our Second Amendment to the Constitution comes from? It comes from the English Bill of Rights in 1689 that the Parliament imposed on King William and Queen Mary, and in it, this Parliament composed of people very concerned about protecting their religious freedom, because remember, they had just overthrown James II because they were afraid he would impose Catholicism on them. These were people who didn't want Anglicanism imposed on them. A lot of them were low church Protestants, Puritans, dissidents. So they've been persecuted by the Anglican thought establishment just as much as the Catholics have. 
So in the English Bill of Rights, they wrote in there, no Protestant may be deprived of the right to bear arms. Now, as a Catholic, that might irritate us, but, you know, in the American version, they got it right. They guaranteed gun rights to every honest citizen. Think about that. What does it mean that they said Protestants can't be disarmed? They were explicitly linking religious freedom with gun rights. Religious freedom is one of the most intimate, perhaps the most important freedom we can think of. It's the freedom to follow your conscience and in your relationship with your maker and your eternal destiny. Religious freedom is the first freedom in our constitution for a reason. What's the second one? It's guarantor, gun rights. This led me to think, this led me to think. And then Jason Jones came back from a trip to Iraqi Kurdistan. We were, he was there to visit persecuted Christians and victims of ISIS. And he met with fathers of families whose wives and daughters had been kidnapped by ISIS and made into sex slaves, put in those computerized databases of sex slaves that ISIS trafficked women, as was confirmed in the New York Times and countless other journals today. Those men, he said, they looked so broken. The one, the one or two people, the daughters and wives who God had given them to protect, they couldn't protect. Why couldn't they protect them? Why were 250 members of ISIS, 250 members, able to take over the whole city of Mosul? Because the Iraqi government had previously disarmed the population. And so they were veal calves. They were lambs when the lions came roaring. So when Jason told me that story, and I started seeing more and more attacks on the Second Amendment, more and more sophisticated multi-front attacks. There's a good book on it called First They Came for the Gun Owners by Mark Smith. I recommend people look at that book. It is a multi-front war using churches, using media, using the courts, using court lawfare, abusive harassing litigation, every single means of multi-million dollar foundations funded by people like Michael Bloomberg who walks in a cloud of armed security guards to attack this basic freedom. Why? why? Why such hostility to people's ability to, you know, to, to hunt and to have a gun in their house to protect it in case of a home invasion? If they get the proper permit from the local government to carry a weapon so that they don't have to wait for the police to come, draw a chalk line around their body. Well, I think it has to do with a basic hostility towards freedom itself. They don't think of the individual the way Christians and Jews, the way biblical people think of the individual. They don't see each of us as having eternal, an eternal destiny, transcendent rights, a kind of nimbus of sanctity around the individual person. Instead, secularists, and by that I include many Catholic bishops and many mainline Protestants and now progressive evangelical people, and pastors, they don't believe in an afterlife. Let's just be candid. Cardinal Tobin, I don't think, believes in an afterlife. I don't think Cardinal Kubitz believes in an afterlife. I don't think Pope Francis does. Maybe they kind of hope for it, but they don't really believe in death, hell, and judgment. They look at this world. They see that they're going to try to build the kingdom of God on this earth. And the way you do that when you've lost your faith in the afterlife and lost your trust in God, is you look instead to Caesar and to projects of social reform. And this happened historically in, in the 19th century. Uh, a lot of what we now call mainline Protestant churches, and used to be quite conservative, a lot of their pastors and their, their seminary professors were really shaken by Darwin's origin of species. It rattled and undermined their faith in biblical inerrancy. And then they were reading higher criticism coming out of Germany and all the so-called scripture scholars who denied the miracles, denied that Jesus even rose from the dead, tried to reduce everything in the Bible to a psychological event. Nothing real, no, no miracles. In fact, the real founder of modern biblical criticism named Boltzmann. Wait, hold, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. That, that's going to 
sound. Now, you say Cardinal Tobin, that doesn't shock me in the slightest, but you mentioned the name of the Pope, that's going to scandalize some people. So, All right, though, if you want, I can leave that out. Well, I don't. I couldn't care less. I think he's an apostate, so it, it yeah. you know, doesn't matter to me. But when, when these are quite shocking things to say about people in the hierarchy. Yeah, well, I think, you know, you have, to, you have to judge people by their fruits and by what they say. Pope Francis keeps doing interviews with this uh, 90-year-old atheist journalist, Sclafari, who keeps reporting that Francis says things like no one's in hell and many other things that are completely outside the Catholic faith. And if I did interviews with a journalist who didn't take notes and didn't transcribe, didn't record, and he reported my comments and I thought he was lying about what I said, I would not do a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth interview with that same journal. Not to mention you would indignantly correct the record the first opportunity. You wouldn't let some semi-spokesman sort of correct things but kind of wink, wink, and leave everything ambiguous and then smile and wave at everybody. That's, that's not the way a normal, innocent person behaves, is it? No. I mean, imagine if Donald Trump were doing interviews with Richard Spencer, and Richard Spencer were reporting that Donald Trump had, you know, unconventional crazy views about the Holocaust in World War II, and then some third-tier person in the press office said, oh, no, that's not really what the president thinks. And then he went and did seven more interviews with Richard yeah, Spencer. exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And people would start to get a little tad, teeny bit suspicious. So in my view, the 19th century loss of supernatural faith that you saw in mainline Protestant churches after Darwin's Origin of Species, where these people who were, they were based on scripture alone, and then scripture seemed to be knocked out from under them because Darwin seemed to challenge the literal interpretation of scripture. So you had lots of people profoundly shaken in their faith, in, especially in mainline establishment Protestant churches. And they wanted to cling to some usefulness for Christianity. I mean, it was their livelihood. They'd spent their whole lives studying it. And what were they going to do? Be like a professional ex-Scientologist? These were clergymen. They were professors of divinity at Union Theological Seminary or Yale Divinity School. So what they invented was what was called the social gospel. That's where, no, Jesus didn't rise from the dead because he wasn't really God. But the ethics, the good manners, the kindness, all the tertiary side effects of Christianity are the essence of Christianity all of a sudden. The essence of Christianity is social progress, is redistributing income, it's polishing off all the sharp edges of life and teaching people to be kind to each other. Basically, Khalil Gibran replacing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this, believe it or not, became the dominant school in Protestant America. You know, obviously you had the exceptions, you had the fundamentalists, God bless them, and the Southern Baptists, and even the evangelical movement, which arose against this kind of theological modernism, but it created the social gospel and progressivism. And if you read Murray Rothbard on the progressive era, if you read Richard Gamble's The War for Righteousness, you see that the move to empower the government over against the individual goes along with this loss of faith in the supernatural reality, the immortality of the soul, our individual responsibility before the judgment seat of Christ. All these things fade away. And instead, people talk about the verdict of history, being on the right side of history, moving history in the right direction. And you get presidents like Woodrow Wilson who treat the Constitution like it's some discredited biblical miracle that we have to explain away and work around or just get out of the way. Well, all that, all that collapse of faith and secular worldliness and ultimately kneeling before Caesar and treating human beings not as images of God, but termites in the colony, all that hit the Catholic Church in the 60s with Vatican II. We managed to cram a hundred years of secularization that had gradually hollowed out the Protestant world. We did it the crash course. We hollowed it every, everything out in 20 or 30 years. And now the kind of people who Pope Francis is willing to appoint as bishops and cardinals 
are people who are completely 100% indistinguishable from United Presbyterian, United Church of Christ, Evangelical Lutheran, Episcopal, or other clergy of dead churches that are essentially real estate holding companies for beautiful old 19th century buildings that they will gradually wrap auction off, but they'll try to stave it off by acting as NGOs and getting lots of government money. And the Catholic bishops, 40% of their budget year in, year out, comes from federal nonprofit contracts, mainly serving immigrants. So that's why you see that when the bishops are so obsessed with keeping immigrants coming into America, they cash a check every time one of them crosses the border. You know what they don't cash a check? If a woman decides to keep her baby. In fact, those pro-life pregnancy centers, they cost money. They cost the church money. The immigration and the, and the welfare state is the profit center. And that's why you see the U.S. Catholic bishops essentially endorsing Biden and Kamala Harris. I, I wrote yesterday on Twitter, they could take the skeleton of Jim Jones and dress it up in the uniform of Joseph Stalin. And if the Democrat Party said so, the U.S. Catholic bishops would say something nice about it. All right. Now, look, that's so much done. But we could obviously do an episode on everything you just said. But let's stay focused on the gun issue. OK, what does this stuff have to how do we bring that back to that topic? Well, if you if your faith has moved from God to Caesar, if you believe in the state as the fundamental actor in human life, not God, not the individual, but that middle squishy thing that pretends to be a God because it can wield the power of life and death, but of course doesn't have the authority or the wisdom of God, the state, that golden calf that it's all too easy and tempting for people to worship. If you think the state is the operative proper fo focus of human effort. Of course, you're going to want the state to organize things. You'll want the state to control the economy for the common good. You'll want the state to have a, a monopoly of violence. You won't trust the average citizen who you, you know, you allow him to drive a 4,000 pound metal machine at 70 miles an hour on a highway, but you won't trust him to carry four pounds of metal in his pocket that he could use to defend himself against violent attackers, against political fanatics, but most importantly, against the government itself if it starts to abuse its power. So the pe very people who have lost faith in the resurrection of Christ and the other biblical miracles, they develop a touching faith in the miraculous power of the state to eliminate crime and violence by passing laws. Well, let me just raise a, I don't know, like a devil's advocate, yeah. well, <laughs> maybe literally devil's advocate uh, objection. <laughs> a lot of times people looking at uh, the history of Christianity or the early church will come back and say that there was a, for example, a reluctance on the part of Christians to be part of the armed forces in, in Rome and that this reflected a general distaste for the use of violence, whether in self-defense or not and that there is some kind of obligation, if not, if not outright pacifism, then nevertheless there is, they would say, something fundamentally incompatible between so-called gun culture in the United States and the more, I don't know, let's say, I don't know, otherworldly approach of, of early Christians. Is there anything to that? Is, is that a misreading? Yes, it's a misreading. It's a sentimental misreading of the early church. First of all, Jesus never told any of the soldiers who became his followers or for whom he performed miracles. He never told them to leave, to, to leave the Roman army. He told them, don't be oppressive. Don't take too much from the people. Don't abuse people. He never suggested to any of them that being in the Roman army was in itself an abuse. I suspect that if Jesus had run into a Klansman burning a cross or someone running an abortion clinic, he would have said, no, this is intrinsically evil, you cut this out. He told the woman an adult caught in adultery, you cut this out. So I don't think we can accuse Jesus of being too lax and letting people get away with sins that, because, I don't know, was he too timid to confront them? <laughs> was he too much of a compromiser? Jesus never told soldiers to leave the Roman army. Not even a democratic regime, okay? The Roman army of occupation. And this was the argument that in the early church eventually killed off Christian pastors. But the other, I think, really important point 
The New Testament and the Old Testament, same God, Father and Son. Too often people treat them as if they were two opposing religions. Well, the Old Testament God said the Jews could fight in self-defense, but the New Testament God says you have to lie in the road and let Hitler roll over you with tanks. No, I'm sorry, that can't be the same God, okay? <laughs> the God of the Old Testament who told Jacob, who told the other Israelites to fight in self-defense, to eliminate the idolaters and, and child sacrificers from their land, that's the same God. And so you cannot interpret Jesus' words in radical contradiction to the words of the Father in the Old Testament. That's the oldest Christian heresy. It was called Marcionism. After Marcion, this very wealthy, arrogant heretic who decided the way to reconcile the Old and New Testament was to the Old Testament was false. The God of the Old Testament was the devil and the Jews were the enemy. That was the first major heresy in Christianity, but it's a persistent heresy. It's so easy. If you can wipe out the Old Testament as all negated, that leaves the New Testament kind of almost almost an empty slate where you can insert your modern political ideology between the lines. And that's what's happening on the left. Now, let's look at a broader question. All right, individual self-defense is one thing, but you know that in the discourse of the Second Amendment in the United States, a lot of times what comes up is an armed citizenry is a last line of defense against tyranny. They talk about that too. So not just against the invader who comes yeah. into your home, but the tyrant who more or less invades the country, right. as it were. So what I want to ask about that is, it also seems that if you were to look in, again, the early centuries of Christianity, you would get the impression that people's view was that if we are ruled by a tyrant, then this is God's judgment upon us. I mean, they, this was there was not, I don't think you can find an early recognition of any idea of a natural right or a, anything in the divine positive law that indicated a right of rebellion. Now, am I wrong That's about right. that? No, that was, a, it took a while for Christians to, to think that one through. On the one hand, we celebrate the Maccabees in the Old Testament who rose up against the, the Greek occupiers who were forcing them to worship pagan gods. But how do we reconcile that with St. Paul's admonition to obey the Roman emperor? In fact, David Coppell, in his book, The Morality of Self-Defense and Military Action, highly recommend that book. He goes through in several chapters how Christians finally came around to this. And it, it, and it kind of started with Pope Gregory VII refusing the, the emperors the power to appoint bishops and saying that the church's authority was higher than that of Caesar. And then you see Thomas Aquinas developing the argument looking also at Maimonides and Maimonides reading of Maccabees, Thomas Aquinas saying, well, no, in fact, if you have the right to self-defense individually, then the community has the right to self-defense collectively against a tyrannical king. The next big development of that was after the Reformation, when you had Catholic monarchs really savagely persecuting Protestants in several countries and Protestants returning the favor in other countries. A lot of Calvinists, Calvinist thinkers, started reading Aquinas and reading Bellarmine and reading Suarez and drawing on their arguments, and they developed quite sophisticated criteria by which the lower-level magistrates in a community could lead a rebellion against the king or the dictator or the emperor if he was abusing his authority and attacking the fundamental rights of the citizens. And here was the change. Religious freedom became defined as one of those fundamental rights. Luther didn't hold this, but Calvin did. You had the Calvinist tradition, which was very powerful in the English-speaking world. It was drawing on Aquinas and on a medieval strain of anti-statism. And that was the matrix from which the American political civic tradition came. Our founders, the Puritans who came over, the, even the Anglicans who came over to Virginia, were more Calvinist-leaning Anglicans. These were not the high church Anglicans. These were the Anglicans who were re reading the Dutch Calvinists on the issue of the, the right of this community to reject a tyrant. So all of this was the kind of the, the yeah, this was the, the soil out of which the American founding generation developed their ideas. And the most important connection was 
Puritan and Calvinist churches all up and down the Atlantic seaboard for a hundred years or so were preaching the necessity of every Christian man to serve in his local militia if he was physically capable, to train, to serve, to defend the community against Indian attack, but also against a potential tyrannical government. And that's why come 1776, especially with the rumor that King George was going to send an Anglican bishops to North America to impose Anglican orthodoxy on the colonies. I'm not saying that's true, but they believed it to be true at the time. The connection between personal liberty and religious liberty found its tangible expression in all the militias that rose up against the British and pretty much, you know, certain with the bulk of, of the American forces apart from General Washington's Continental Army. Folks, let me take just a brief minute to tell you about the way I solve a major problem that we all have. Because we're all intellectuals, we have a pile of books we want to read, we have no idea how we're going to get through all of them. And the answer is Blinkist. It's unique and powerful, works on your phone, your tablet, your web browser. It gives you the best key takeaways, the need-to-know information from over 3,000 nonfiction bestsellers in over 27 categories. Blinkist condenses them down into Blinks, which you can read or listen to in just 15 minutes. And I like Blinkist because after that 15-minute blink, I know whether or not the full-length audiobook is really a good use of my time. I use Blinkist when I'm driving around in the car, which would otherwise be dead time, and I'm absorbing book after book while I drive. I've listened to these Blinks, and I highly recommend you check them out. Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker and The Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership and up to 65% off audiobooks, yours to keep forever. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off a premium membership and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. I think some of this view of what Christians are supposed to believe about whether it's gun rights or a wide variety of other issues, uh, the welfare state or whatever else, comes from a view of Christ that is developed by, I don't even think we can blame the social gospel for it. I think it's like sentimental, but maybe secularists more or less, who want, who know in their hearts they should admire Christ on some level. And so they make of him this harmless, saccharine, sweet person who just wants everybody to be nice to each other. And unfortunately, Christians and quote unquote organized religion have distorted this simple vision of of Christ. And I jokingly said the other day that the best part of being alive is having atheists explain Christianity to me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, what you just described, it sounds like estrogen pills like the kind that they give sex offenders to chemically castrate them. They seem to think Jesus was the estrogen pill that the human race needed to take so its beard would fall off and it could complete its gender transitioning. And so what follows from this is that almost anything that Christians who, I don't know, know something about their tradition want to say and defend is is scoffed at, brushed aside, yeah. And 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 by people who, by the way, you know, they're they're very happy to cite one verse, yeah, one other verse. But if I if I cite twenty eight other verses back to them and say, well, then I guess if you're demanding that I believe such and such on the basis of the Bible, I guess you have to believe these things. They wouldn't accept any of those. So of I don't course. even know what the point of this exercise is. Right. Well, what I like to do with those people is there's almost always if they're saying a counterexample that will disprove their position. So, for instance, I would say, oh, so you're if you're saying we should never resist the tyrannical authority and Jesus wouldn't want that. okay. so we go to the Warsaw Ghetto in 1944, where pagan Nazis are murdering Jesus's fellow Jews. Jesus would tell them, no, you don't have the right to fight back. Don't defend yourself. Let the Nazis send you to Auschwitz. You're saying that's what Jesus would want. Right. Right. Or take some up, take some other obvious hard case where they would be emotionally uncomfortable applying their, quote, logic, unquote, because it's so obviously absurd. For instance, if, they, if they're preaching absolute nonviolence, okay, so if you were one of those fathers in Iraq 
and ISIS was coming to kidnap your 14 and 12 year old daughters and take them off to be sex slaves, you're saying you shouldn't protect your daughters, right? Because Jesus would want you to sit there in your deck chair and watch your daughters get carried off, right? If that's Christianity, it's false. I'll persecute it myself. Well, not to mention, I think Aquinas, I don't know if he would put it quite this way, but he makes a distinction between the private views you may hold with regard to how you yourself intend or do not intend to defend yourself. But when it comes to other people and the welfare of other people, well, that's quite another matter to say that I'm morally superior to you because I'll sit by and and let that kid get tortured while you would intervene and stop it, again, seems rather perverse. Right, and, and let me apply that to the gun control issue. The, gu- the way the religious left, including our bishops, operate on the gun issue is they're kind of the pacifist inquisition. They, they don't just say we would turn the other cheek if people came to rob the gold fillings out of our teeth. We are pure Christian. No, they want to impose that on everyone. They want to use the power of the state to affirmatively disarm the entire population. And that means imprisoning people if they disobey the gun laws, right? So they want to put people in prison using the violent force of the state in order to force them all to be pacifists. So, I mean, even the Anabaptists and the early Christians who rejected the use of force, they would not have wanted the government to get a monopoly of force by violently disarming the population. This is a, an interesting, perverse hybridization of early church, otherworldly pacifism, and modern socialist state worship. It's an ugly, ugly combination. And in my article at stream.org, God, Guns, and the Government, I go through the typical statements of these left-wing churchmen. What I did was I looked at press releases from mainline Protestant, official Catholic bishops, and liberal evangelicals after a mass shooting. And and after there is some hideous mass shooting, there is an inevitable outcrop of outrage calls for the total disarmament of the population in response to this one psychopath. In fact, do you mind if I want to read one of these, if I may? Okay, so this one comes from the National Council of Churches, which is, I mean, you would just want to jump off a cliff if you had to be involved with that organization. And, And this is what they said. This is part of their statement. This is from last year, 2019. We are deeply discouraged by the awareness of the near certainty that our elected officials will not respond in any meaningful way to this violence, for they are collectively and shamefully within the captivity of the gun lobby. Our elected leaders are guilty of negligence and cowardice. (laughs) Yes, look who's talking, right? And then incendiary language from leaders must uh, also must be boldly and consistently condemned and countered. Racist, inflammatory rhetoric must be replaced by words and deeds that create beloved communities, ones that embrace ethnic, racial, and religious diversity. These are the values we wish to see in a vibrant, inclusive America. The combination of readily available weapons of mass destruction and a toxic white racist nationalist ideology is a recipe for disaster. If we cannot confront these two evils, far greater violence and social disruption awaits our nation. All right, well, we, we know what all, those, what all that means, and it sounds like it could have been written by Hillary Clinton. So given that we already have Hillary Clinton, what do we need the National Council of Churches for? I have no idea. Let me read- Or the U.S. Catholic bishop. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know, yeah, right, exactly the same. Let me just read, I want to read your paragraph immediately after that where you comment on this. And you say, apart from the long list of woke buzzwords that these religious leaders encant, the most notable thing in this statement is the use of impersonal public health jargon to describe horrific acts by mentally disturbed or evil individuals aimed at other individual citizens. These churchmen can't speak of murder. They don't cite the Ten Commandments. They say nothing of the sanctity of life or even the rights of the victims. Instead, they speak of guns as if they were evil totems in a fetishistic religion. They discuss gun violence as if it were a newly emergent virus or an atmospheric pollutant. When they do engage moral issues, it's only to chide politicians and the gun lobby for resisting specific legal measures to restrict Americans' constitutional rights. The statement nowhere acknowledges those rights, the rights of citizens to defend themselves from threats. Yeah. Yeah, so this is why I wrote, you know, I co-wrote this 10,000-word article, uh, God, Guns, and the Government. Our goal is to provide 
a quick go-to resource for anyone having these kind of arguments with his fellow Christians, his pastor, seminary professor, bishop. We go through the entire argument from natural law through the Old Testament, through Roman history, medieval history, the American founding up to the present. Our hope is that we can give people solid, solid material that actually engages the real intellectual arguments instead of engaging in all this emotional virtue signaling and emotional manipulation. I never see anything else. I never see solid arguments coming from the left on these subjects. They seem to know that they can't win on the merits, so they're going to try to win through gaslighting and the Stockholm syndrome. Well, let me just close with this. I have to say that the left must be the poorest winners I've ever encountered. They have conquered every sector of society, including the vast bulk of the churches, and yet they can't be magnanimous in victory. They have to hound you, ruin your career, destroy your reputation, smear you, misrepresent you, demonize you, intimidate people into silence. I mean, these are some, you know, these are some people full of Christian love, aren't they? You know, whereas, whereas on our side, I think, frankly, I mean, I gave this example. This, it's not the, the greatest example in the world, but it's not nothing. There's a, an organization called Liberty Fund, and it publishes a lot of classic works of the classical liberal tradition in inexpensive editions. But they also hold scholarly colloquia. And I pointed out that and when I, I started going to those in the late 90s, it's by invitation only. And then in the early 2000s, I stopped accepting invitations to it because I just didn't want to leave my family. But the point is, as I went to the last few of them, I noticed that it wasn't any longer that they were inviting 15 scholars, you know, of, of more or less like mind, of like you and me together to discuss something. They started to bring in people on the left to discuss with them. Now, there's nothing in principle wrong with that, but it dawned on me that, there's no left-wing organization that's going to say, you know, we really need more of an anti-state representation here in this conversation. It would not occur to them in any way, whereas our folks were thinking, you know, we genuinely want to have a real discussion with people. That does not happen on the other side because they're poor like winners. It. Not just that, Tom. Not just that. They know on some level that they're wrong. They know on some level their arguments can't withstand scrutiny, can't take criticism, as Eric Vogelin wrote in his great book, Science, Politics, and Gnosticism, he said these modern Gnostics with the, with the pseudo-religions they invent, whether it's Nazism or communism, they know on some level they're in intellectual bad faith and that there are questions you could ask about their fundamental premises, which would bring their whole house of cards tumbling down. And so the way they keep their house of cards intact is by forbidding those questions. And they forbid those questions rhetorically, as Marx does. They, were, they forbid them by sending the police to your door to arrest people who ask those questions or kick them off social media or get them fired. So I think this is a sign of a less profound weakness. They know on some level that they're operating in bad faith and they don't want us to bring out the kryptonite. They don't want us to throw the bucket of water on them because they'll melt like the witch in the Wizard of Oz. Well, I... I wouldn't rule that out. That's not an impossibility, particularly when in those rare occasions when I have gotten people like this to engage rather than just demonize and call names. They are some of the most uninformed, ignorant people I have ever encountered. They have absolutely no idea what the other side believes. They know it only in caricature. If they're being sincere, maybe they really do and they just want to caricature. I don't know, but they haven't read things that let's say they should have read. I mean, I mean, we could go on and on. I mean, there, there are people in women's studies departments who are doing, you know, histories of, of women, women's oppression in ancient Athens. And by the way, ancient Athens did treat women badly and the church treated them much better than they did it in, uh, right. in, in classical antiquity. But the point is uh, some of them don't even, don't even know how to read or write Greek. Right. You know, and, and these are the ones who are supposed to pose as the experts. Yeah, if I were them, I wouldn't want to engage my opponents either. That's right. That's right. So it kind of makes me think back to the 1920s and 30s when Harvard and Yale and Princeton all had Jewish quotas. They knew that if they let Jews come in on their merits, they would displace the dopey legacy admissions from all the WASPy prep schools. So they had a limit, a strict limit on the percentage of Jews. Of course, now they do that, but they do that to Asians. 
Well, let me say one, one or just as long as you brought that up, I'll, I'll wrap up with this. I used to do alumni interviewing for Harvard because it's it's optional to have an alumni interview. Or, or, no, 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 I take that back. It's optional to have an on-campus interview because maybe you can't get there. But it is required. You have to be interviewed by an alumnus. And so I used to do that when I lived on Long Island. And people would come to my office and, and I would interview them. And, and it was a great experience and I got to meet some extremely talented and impressive young people. And I'll never forget this young woman who came in who was so unbelievably qualified and so accomplished in so many areas. And I mean, obviously had all the test scores and everything. I had never in my entire life come across anyone who could touch the level of accomplishment of this particular student. It, it amazed me. That same season, an athlete came in to talk to me. He gave me one-word answers. He was as unimpressive as you could imagine. Now, he had nothing else. He was a, he was a white man. He had no uh, affirmative action categories other than he was an athlete, and there is some, they say there isn't, but there is some preference shown to certain types of athletes. He was the most unimpressive student I had seen in my years of interviewing. He got in immediately, and the other girl got waitlisted, yep. waitlisted. And, and so she eventually went to Cornell and I wrote to her family and I said, I resigned as an interviewer because of this ridiculous decision. It's a joke. Wow. Well, I'm lucky that there was a good conservative alum who interviewed me for, for Yale. And uh, my interview was, was kind of entertaining. I think I we have to wrap it up. I have kind of- a Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> I know, but this is fun anyway, right? <laughs> All right. Well, listen, John, I appreciate your time. I'm going to direct people to the show notes page. That's where I've, I mean, of course, stream.org, they should check out, but I'll have a link directly to your article at uh, tomwoods.com slash 1717. So thanks again. Thanks, Tom. All right, everybody, that's our episode for today. A couple quick things. Uh, tomorrow, I am going to be sharing, well, let's just say some of my communication secrets. I do a lot of public speaking. I've been doing it for 25 years. And some people have asked me, what are your public speaking secrets, or what can I learn from you about public speaking? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And what follows from that also is just generally techniques for persuasion. So I'll be covering that tomorrow. Then uh, the other thing is, given that we've just talked about this topic, another resource you might want to check out is my free ebook. What else would it be? Called Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Guns. And you can get that at wrongaboutguns.com. So check that out, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.